Please follow along as we do notes today on covalent bonding. Covalent bonds are different than ionic or metallic bonds because these bonds occur between two nonmetal atoms. And what's really unique about these two nonmetal atoms is because they actually both want to gain electrons and can't really steal one from the other, what they end up doing is sharing those electrons. These special types of bonds end up forming what we call molecules. Throughout the year, we've probably used this word, sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly, but technically you should only ever call something a molecule if it's covalently bonded because it's between two nonmetal atoms. Those nonmetal atoms can be two of the same element or they can be two different elements. So we're going to look at what type of molecules form as a result of those. So the first type of covalent bond we're going to talk about is called nonpolar. And it's called nonpolar because there's no polarity to the bond. And that might make a little more sense once we start drawing what that looks like. But nonpolar molecules are the result of equal sharing of electrons. And it's equal sharing because the two atoms have the same electronegativity. It's the same electronegativity because though it's two atoms of the same element. So these are our diatomic molecules. The ones we memorized earlier this school year when we remember the phrase, I bring clay for our new house, meaning iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Those are all examples of elements that form diatomic molecules. And because they're two atoms of the same element, they have the same electronegativity, and they will end up with equal sharing of the electrons. The electrons are going to spend just as much time with one atom as they do with the other atom. So let's talk about an example of what this might look like. I'd like to use one of our halogens as an example. So just for fun, we'll pick fluorine. Earlier this year, we learned how to draw the dot diagram for fluorine. And when you look up fluorine's valence number, it's 7. So typically, we draw that 1, 2, 3, four, five, six, seven. So what you'll notice is that fluorine has this one unpaired electron here, and it would like to gain one more electron in order to have that full valence shell. So when we form the molecule F2, what's really happening is there's two atoms of fluorine, and that seventh electron in each of those atoms is being shared between the two atoms. So I'm going to draw this again, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the dot structure so that my unpaired electron will be facing the other dot structure I'm going to draw for fluorine. So here's one of my fluorines, and I'm just going to rotate this. So I still have my three paired elect or three sets of paired electrons, but here's now my unpaired electron. For my other fluorine atom, I'm going to draw it just like we saw it here, except just so that you can see what happens. I'm going to use X's instead of dots for the electrons. So now to satisfy both the atoms of fluorine and getting their full octet, these two electrons are going to be shared between the two atoms. 
Some people even draw it so that it looks more like this, where you can see the one electron from the one fluorine and the other kind of equally paired between the two, like so. And then I'll just finish out my pairs of electrons like this. Okay, so sometimes you'll see it like that. Another acceptable way that you could draw this is with the pair of electrons just being a line between the two. And that line will represent that shared pair of electrons. So when you go to count how many electrons your fluorines have, you have to count that line as if it's a pair of electrons. So let's see, now that we've been talking about the full octet and what that does for the atoms, let's count the atoms around, or the electrons around this fluorine atom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then this fluorine atom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because these two are shared. And you can do the same thing when you have the line like this. Just make sure you count that as if it's two. So you can count them as pairs. Two, four, six, eight. And the other atom, two, four, six, eight. And that's really the point of any atom forming a bond with another atom to get that full octet it's a much more stable configuration, and it's always the result in bonding that you end up with a more stable configuration. Because the electrons are shared equally, there's no polarity in this bond, meaning that the electron's not spending more time with one fluorine atom over another. So overall, and we'll talk more about this later, but overall this molecule has no polarity. It's a nonpolar molecule. Now let's talk about what happens when it's not nonpolar, but instead is polar. So a polar molecule results from an unequal sharing of the electrons. An unequal sharing happens when you have two different elements forming a bond with each other. And that'll happen probably more often than the nonpolar ones. But what happens is, just like if you and your sibling were to say, hey, if, if we pool our money, we can buy, maybe you did this when you were young, we can buy a bouncy ball and we'll share it. And it never quite turns out that it's equally shared. It's going to end up spending more time with one sibling over the other. And the same thing happens with electrons. These molecules, because they do have some polarity to them, are often called dipole molecules because they have two poles. One end is positive and the other is negative. So let's talk about what some of those might look like. A first example I'd like to talk about is um, hydrogen fluoride or hydrofluoric acid. HF. So the first thing you want to do when you try to figure out a dot structure or the bonding with a dot structure is figure out the dot structure. So hydrogen, you look it up, it has one valence electron. And then once again, I'm going to use X's for the other one. Fluorine, we just said, has seven. So it would look like this. Now, what's unique about hydrogen and helium is that they actually have a full valence shell with just two electrons. So hydrogen wants just one more electron, and fluorine wants just one more electron. So I'm going to redraw this so that this hydrogen's lone electron is on the side so it can share with fluorine. And I'm going to draw it like the, the nicely drawn one I had on the right up here so that you can see how they're sharing them. Now, maybe wait till you see me draw the whole thing before you draw it, because what's going to end up happening is fluorine has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen. So the way I'm going to draw it right now, and you don't always have to do this, notice that the, the pair of electrons that's being shared is closer to fluorine. Fluorine, if you recall, has an electronegativity of 4.0. 
Hydrogen, I believe, is 2.2. They changed it a couple of years ago. So it has a much lower electronegativity than that of fluorine. So they're going to spend a lot more time over here with fluorine than they do with hydrogen. The way to draw that with the line, you draw the hydrogen, and then it just has the one pair of electrons. And then here's fluorine. It has its six pairs plus the pair that it's sharing between hydrogen and fluorine, like so. Some people like to draw the line really long. I don't think that shows the polarity quite as well. But the other way to show that is by showing the polarity with an arrow. So you can show the electrons are going to spend more time with fluorine because fluorine's electronegativity, we looked up, it's four. Remember, you can always look that up in table S. And then hydrogen is only 2.2. What ends up happening as a result is there is a partial charge along that bond. Fluorine ends up being partially negative, and hydrogen ends up being partially positive. And that's actually a, a Greek letter delta, lowercase delta. We've used uppercase before. So that's a lowercase delta, and that's what we use to signify a partial charge. So this molecule that we just came up with here, HF, is what we would call a linear molecule. It has just the one bond, and it's in line. There's other examples, though, and I want to quickly go through them. One is a bent molecule, and a bent molecule, um, you often see this with elements like selenium. In selenium, when you draw its dot structure, since it has six valence electrons, it would look like this. So the two electrons it has available in order to bond are on adjacent sides. So what you end up doing, like if we were to, say, bond this with hydrogen, since we've been working with hydrogen, and I think I'll just use a different color since I use dots, we have our hydrogen, here's hydrogen's electron that it's donating, and it can only make that one bond. So in order to satisfy selenium, you need to have a second hydrogen to donate the other electron that it needs. Now when we go to count them, hydrogen has the two that it desires, because remember hydrogen and helium only need two to be full, but selenium has two, four, six, eight total electrons, which is exactly what it needs. Now the way that this molecule looks is bent. So this is a bent-shaped molecule. There's one more I want to talk about. We're going to do ammonia. Ammonia, if you recall, is uh, nitrogen with three hydrogens. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five. So it has three unpaired electrons that need to be paired up with something else. In this case, it's going to be hydrogen. Again, I'm going to use the red for my hydrogen. You could use X's if you want. And you can see this time it's not going to end up being a linear molecule, but you can see it's, and it's not bent either. I'm sure there's a name for it, but it is definitely a different shape than the other ones we've talked about. So let's talk about the END. END is electronegativity difference. And the electronegativity difference can help predict the strength of the bond. So when you look up the electronegativities of the two atoms in the bond, you can figure out the electronegativity difference, which will help to predict the strength of that bond. So we had already looked up that hydrogen was 2.2 and fluorine was 4.0. And we'll do the absolute value of that difference, and you're going to end up with 1.8. When you look up the electronegativity of carbon in table S, it's 2.6. And then we're going to subtract the 2.2 for hydrogen. Again, absolute value in this case, it, it'll be the same. Ends up being 0 0.4. 
considerably less than that for the HF. Now for water, we have again 2.2 and oxygen when you look it up is 3.5. We'll do the absolute value, you get 1.3. Bromine, it's going to be between two atoms of the same element. So bromine is actually 3.0, not that it matters, because when you take the difference of two of the same numbers, you're going to end up with zero. So the one that has the strongest bond is the one that has the highest electronegativity difference, which works out to be HF with an electronegativity difference of 1.8. Now we're going to do a little more practice with drawing these structures. I did put in a little hint here that actually coming up with a formula first can be helpful for some students. Other students really appreciate first finding the number of unpaired electrons and then from there figuring out how many of the other element you need in order to make both elements happy. So we're going to try it that way first. We have hydrogen and bromine. When you look up hydrogen in the periodic table, again, its valence number is 1, so it's going to have one valence electron. And keep in mind that hydrogen really only wants one more electron. Bromine is in group 17, and it has seven valence electrons. So like most elements, it would like a total of eight. So bromine wants one more electron to pair up here with its unpaired electron and hydrogen wants one more electron to pair up with its one unpaired electron. So I'm going to rotate this down and I'm going to draw it like this and then the X is from the bromine like this and then the alternative way of drawing that would be to draw a line for the bond on bromine and then the X is around the outside here. Now everyone's satisfied. Hydrogen has its two. Bromine has two, four, six, eight total electrons, and it's happy. So we came up with the dot diagrams of each of the elements. Now we just need to show the electronegativities to show the polarity of each bond. So to figure out the polarity of the bond, we have to look up the electronegativities of these two elements. Hydrogen is 2.2 and bromine is 3.0. So when we draw in our little arrow to show our polarity, the arrow is going to point toward bromine. You're always going to point toward the one with a higher electronegativity. All right, let's go ahead and try with sulfur and hydrogen. Sulfur this time has six valence electrons. So sulfur would look like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. So sulfur has two unpaired electrons that would like to share with another element. Hydrogen, I'm going to use X's I guess. Hydrogen has just one valence electron so it would like one more. So in order to satisfy both sulfur and hydrogen, you're going to need a hydrogen hanging out here and a hydrogen hanging out here. So let's try drawing that. We have sulfur. And then we'll have a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here, which alternatively could be drawn with the lines like so. It's really hard to show the polarity of the bonds unless you do write them that way. This time, rather than looking up the numbers, you can do that on your own. And I'm going to let you know sulfur is higher. So it's going to be like that. If I remember correctly, sulfur is 2.6, just like carbon. This molecule actually has a bent shape. And that will become more important when we talk about the polarity of molecules instead of just the polarity of bonds. All right, next one we have carbon and hydrogen. Carbon is a sneaky little fella. Carbon has just four valence electrons. But since 
the way we draw it like this, it only leaves the opportunity to make two bonds. What carbon ends up doing is moving one of its electrons, like so, so that it has four opportunities to make bonds. And then again, hydrogen has just one electron. So when you go to make your bonds with each of your unpaired electrons on carbon, you're going to need four hydrogens to do that. So here's our carbon with its now moved electrons so that it can make lots of bonds. And then we'll need a hydrogen on each side in order to satisfy that. Like so. And alternatively to draw that, it looks like this. And then carbon's electronegativity is 2.6. Hydrogen's 2.2, so all our arrows are going to point in. Where do I have that? Yeah, that's right. Point in toward carbon. Knowing how to draw those arrows is going to be super important a little later on. The last one I want to talk about is when carbon bonds with oxygen. In this situation, something happens that you would not probably be able to predict, so you're going to need to memorize this. Carbon has those movable electrons so that it can maximize its bonding and end up with that total of eight electrons that carbon needs. And when it does that with oxygen, because oxygen has six valence electrons, something weird happens. Carbon has four valence electrons and needs to make four bonds. So the only way to make this work is if oxygen moves its two unpaired electrons next to each other, carbon does the same thing, and then makes what we call double bonds. So let me show you what this looks like. So here's your carbon moving its electrons so that it can make those double bonds with oxygen. So here's one oxygen, but we need another one in order to make the total of four bonds that carbon needs. And that's what it looks like. Alternatively, with the lines, a double bond looks like this. And then your other electrons on oxygen, so you have the proper number look like this. Let's count them now, make sure everybody's happy. Two, four, six eight, two, four, six, eight, and then on carbon, two, four, six, eight. And you could count that here too. So we have two, four, six, eight on carbon, two, four. Now when you go to draw the polarity of these bonds, oxygens is actually a little higher than carbon, 3.5 versus 2.6. So you're going to draw your arrows out like this. Again, this is something that you should probably memorize because you're not going to come up with that on your own. That's a toughie. And that's it for our notes. We'll need to do a lot of practice on this in class, and I look forward to helping you guys understand it.